Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that the weather held up enough we could have second and third service at least today. Lord, what a interesting world we're living in. You warned us in this time when Israel would be back in the land that evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. And yeah, never has it been a better time for your church to simply be in love with Jesus. Here we are on Valentine's Day. You so loved the world, you so loved us, you traded your son so that you could dismiss our case. No one has ever loved us like that. And so we sit at your feet. We pray your word would open to every heart that's here, every heart that's listening. We're gonna look at what you've created. You created it for fellowship with you. You love what you've made and you want it back. And so, Lord, how I pray for anyone that doesn't know you today, may they hear your voice through simple facts that you've created them to be in a relationship with you and you are desiring for them to finally surrender and open their heart. Bless this time in your word, we pray. Thank you for loving us from before the foundation of the world. And thank you for knowing you would have to redeem us to yourself and doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, verse 4, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, sky to us. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven, the atmosphere, and to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, or two lights, yeah, two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also, and he set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So we pick up now verse 20. And God said, again, Elohim, more than two, third person, masculine, singular, he, and God, he said, let the waters bring forth, or swarm is the idea, abundantly, the moving creature, that hath, here is a new word for us, nefesh, life. Translated 475 times soul. Translated life 117 times. Translated mind 15 times and a few others, but nefesh. And this is what sets the animal realm and the human realm apart from the plant realm. Plants have a body as we saw. Animals have a body as we are learning here, but they also have nefesh, a soul. You have a body. How many of you have brought it to church? 
How many of you watched it before you came here? <laughs> Never mind. You have a body, you have a soul, but in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, you're told you also have a third component. You have a spirit. Your body, soul, and spirit. Paul writing to the Thessalonians said, I pray the Lord preserve you body, soul, and spirit. Soma, suke, pneuma, spirit, as a pneumatic. And so the animals have body and nefesh. Animals are, again, there are various ranges within them, but you look at things like dolphins, whales, and etc. They are self-aware. They know when something is living or dead. As we study them more and more, we find they have quite elaborate rituals for all kinds of different things that they do. And so they have something that the plant realm does not. A, they're able to move around without being stuck. And also B, they have a different level of awareness, or we might even say consciousness. And of course, cat lovers and dog lovers swear about their personalities and on and on and on. I get it. They have nefesh. Adam, Eve, man, also receives from God a spirit. And as we'll get into chapter 3, we'll eventually get there. When they disobeyed one commandment, the Lord said to him, The day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Yet Adam continues 930 years. He still knows who he is. So what died in Adam is he died spiritually. And this is why when Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3, he's a teacher, a master teacher of the Jews. If there's anybody who could earn it with God, it's Nicodemus. He keeps the law. He keeps the tradition. He does everything right. And Jesus said to him, you must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, physical birth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. You could not birth yourself physically. Your mother did it. You cannot birth yourself spiritually. It comes from God when you trust in Jesus Christ. This is why in Ephesians chapter 2, when Paul would write to them, he said, You has he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. You're physically alive and you know who you are, but apart from Jesus, you're dead in sins and trespasses. But when you accept Christ as your Savior, you finally believe the truth of the Word of God, ask His forgiveness, you are then born again, and that's when your life begins to change. It should. Because now instead of being ruled by your flesh, how many know what that's like? Liars. <laughs> you all know what it's like to be ruled by your flesh. To then suddenly rule by your, the Spirit of God that's in you. It's through the Spirit that we have a relationship with God. But after Adam and Eve sin, everyone is born spiritually dead, spiritually separated away from God. So the animals here receive nefesh, soul, life, the idea, self-aware, personality, etc., etc. We'll learn more about it in heaven. Meanwhile, at least we acknowledge it. Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath nefesh, life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament, which we learned of back in verse 7 and 8, that has water above and below it. You'll need that for the flood. <clears throat> in the sky, let them fly in the open firmament of heaven. And God created. Here's the second time we see the word bara, taking or creating something from nothing. He just brings it forth. God created bara, Whales. It says here, great whales. The word is galdal tanin. It is great, large, massive mega. And tanin is, is whale or even sea monster, sea serpent, sea creature. Big stuff. Big stuff in the sea. Tanin can also, for example, explain dinosaurs. The word dinosaur doesn't show up from Richard Owen until around 1842. 1842. King James translated 1611. How many see there's a difference? So in King James, you'll see the word dragons used because they didn't have the word dinosaur. Dragons. Job talks about them, or God talks about them to Job. We'll go through some of that later, talk about it with the flood. But for now, just notice that these things in the sea are big, which would include whales as well as some other things we'll think about today. And every living nefesh creature that moveth, and the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, which means when they have babies, the babies will look like them. Everybody got it? When they have babies, the babies will. So, what will whales have? What will dolphins have? What will horseshoe crabs have? What will you have? I have a burger and fries. No, it's not time for that yet. You babies, they look like you. 
It's really fun as, you know, the church moves on, you can look and go, I know whose kid that is. Like, you can just, you can pick it out. I know we're guilty of that too, but that's a Swanson. Yeah, that's one. After their kind. Verse 21, every winged fowl after his kind. Fifth use. Everything reproduces after its kind, according to God's creation. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, again, third person, masculine, and singular. He blessed them, saying, be fruitful, para, it's an imperative, flourish, produce, have offspring. Be fruitful and multiply and fill. The word is male, fill. We're going to need it later. See how it's first used, fill. We'll take care of an objection to Genesis a little later because of this. Fill the waters in the seas and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So let's get into some slides. Day five, sea creatures, birds. Nice. Day five, sea creatures, birds. First things first, how many have ever flown over the Pacific or the Atlantic? How many realize it's a lot of water? And you're just seeing the top. Here in the Marianas Trench, this is a graphic put out by Business Insider in 2014. And this is showing the depths of lakes and oceans. And this long depth to the left of your page is the Marianas Trench uh, that has a Challenger Deep, which is basically seven miles deep. So when you fly, how many have flown over the Pacific? Say going to Hawaii or Asia or whatever. How many have flown over the Atlantic? Looked out your window and you say, you look out the window and you go, well, that's a lot of water. Yes. And that's just the top. Think about it. 6.77 miles deep, the Challenger Deep. That's a lot of water. 35,000 feet deep. The Edmund Fitzgerald, how many have heard the long song from the 70s? It feels like it'll never end. If you haven't, Google it and, you know, give yourself 10 minutes and once will be enough. Uh, the Edmund Fitzgerald, the Kursk, the Russian sub in Lusitania, they all sank in water that were shallower than they were long. Had you been able to prop the boats up on their bow, their sterns would have stuck out. And yet it was tragic enough that they would be basically a total loss. So to give you that idea, here's where they sank. And that's something, oh, that's terrible. The Challenger, way down. Some little interesting facts you get out of this. First of all, uh, the Alvin sub, one of the deepest research subs we know, although that could change in 10 minutes, but it goes about 4,000, 4,500 meters. God said to Job, have you seen the springs of the sea? It took until 1977 to develop a predecessor to this kind of research sub. 1977 is the first time we got a sub strong enough to go far enough down that we discovered fresh water and saltwater springs in the sea. Only God could have known it. And he asked Job, have you seen them? So interesting facts as we look at this. Number one, if you have a scuba tank down here, 2,000 meters and plus, and you shoot it with a bullet, the water will rush in, the air will not rush out in a pressurized tank. <clears throat> Take a champagne bottle about this deep, and the cork will pop into the bottle. That's the kind of pressure we're talking about when you get that far down. So back to giant sea monsters, tannin. Here, a head was found of a prehistoric pilosaur or pileosaur. The head is eight feet long. The head is eight feet long. They figure the thing's about 54 feet in length. Uh, it supposedly roamed the seas here, and they, they have evidence. They know this thing existed. It roamed the warm seas over what is now southern Britain. Warm seas in Britain? 150 million years ago. So we find big stuff. We still find big stuff, and it's still alive as well. 2007, this was a colossal squid, about 39 feet long, weighed about 990 pounds, and they just happened to hook it. It's a big, colossal squid. Of course, these were rare. They don't often see these. This is in New Zealand where they found it. Here is a, how many like jellyfish? This one weighs about 440 pounds. It's two meters across, about, what, uh, seven plus feet across on the top. It accidentally sank a Japanese fishing trawler. There's big stuff floating around still in the seas. This in 2005 was a record breaker, something we'd never seen before. This is a giant squid, not to be confused with the colossal squid. And it was found and filmed 2,900 feet, 3,000 feet down basically. 
they figured out a way to lower a camera. I think it was Japanese fishermen that did. They lowered a camera, they took the photos, and for the first time in human history, they got these things in their habitat on film. Well, we're in 2021, and our technology has gotten better. Audio, please, gentlemen. <laughs> Seven minutes go by, yet the giant remains. Surface, surface, Triton. Giant squid. We have the giant squid. And we have a lot of footage. It's all going very, very well. <laughs> and of course, it's actually 2019 footage has even more. This clip is incredible because we're seeing the squid in its natural habitat in the deep sea. It's never been done before. The footage is a first, but the estimated size of the squid is just 14 feet long. <laughs> just 14. Half the size of the beast that attacked the racing yacht Geronimo. But Dr. Widder is not deterred. In 2019, she relocates her search to the Gulf of Mexico, a hundred miles off the coast of Louisiana. Her team has developed the electronic lure to mimic the light patterns of the Atola deep sea jellyfish, which attracts giant squid. The, the genius of Edith Widder's work is that she created this camera that can run for a really long time at great depths, which is where you need to be to see these squid. And she attached it to this lure that had a, a strobing flashing light to attract the squid. We're visual animals. And so when humans have gone down to explore the deep sea, traditionally we go down and shine these great lights so that we can see everything. But in reality, it probably scares a lot of things away. To avoid this, Dr. Widder's team use infrared cameras to penetrate the darkness, allowing them to see, but not disturb, the creatures that come to investigate the electronic bait. Hours and hours of darkness with maybe the occasional flash of something going by. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, come these tentacles. massive. This giant squid is taller than a two-story house, easily big enough to take on the racing trimaran, Geronimo. So could this be the legendary Kraken, breaker of ships? We just now know they're there. So it's answered one question, it's opened up about a bazillion more. 2019, we just now know they're there. 1977, off the coast of New Zealand, where, by the way, near that colossal squid finding, off the coast of New Zealand, a Japanese fishing boat reeled in a 32-foot-long object that had weighed 4,000 pounds. They got it from 900 feet down. It was rotting. It stank. It had a neck. It had long fins. It was very odd. They happened to have a marine biologist on that ship. He laid it out, they put it on the deck, he took a skin, a fin sample from it, he did a drawing, and he confirmed, in his opinion, it was a plesiosaur. Now, Creation Ministries, if they're watching, like, don't use this one. Don't. There's a marine biologist on the boat. And the guy says, I think we found ourselves a plesiosaur. They examined the, the tissue of that animal and they found in it that it had a lastodin, which is also in basking sharks. And so they said, well, it's got to be a basking shark because they have a lastodin. Well, plesiosaur could as well. We have nothing else to compare it to. But it came up nonetheless. So convinced were they, the Japanese made a stamp commemorating it. And we're just starting to find way down deep what's really there. And it's almost seven miles deep at the deepest point. So it brings up a question. Why is it we find, and we'll get to this with some index fossils in the next course of a few weeks, and we'll see a couple today. Why is it we find things living in the ocean that are extreme age, 
that may even well be, for example, if it is a plesiosaur, have survived what killed off all the rest of the land dinosaurs that were extreme age. What could have come to the earth that would kill everything on the land but somehow spare some sample still in the ocean? A flood. Which means we ought to find really old stuff still alive in the ocean. This from 1925 off Santa Cruz Beach in California, washed up, is being reprinted in Skin Diver magazine. That guy's holding a rifle. They're obviously worried. The neck is 20 feet long. This thing washed ashore in California. Of course, the critics said it's a whale. So the answer to that was, well, gee, what whale has a neck? This was unusual. This isn't the only time here in 1970 in Nova Scotia. This thing washes aboard. It washes up on shore 50 feet long. Here, 2003, this is what they think was a giant octopus 39 feet long. In other words, we have really big stuff way down deep in the ocean, and occasionally it gets stranded out on a beach. Here in 2014, was it? No, 2018, they found three different sp fish species 7,000 meters down. First time they found them. We're still finding things. So in Georgia, March 19th, 2018, South Georgia, this washed up on the beach. It was snake-like, appeared to be a fin. Small creature captured the imagination of the web, given how similar it looked to a legendary sea creature that may or may not exist. This guy who caught it went to this place called Skipper's Fish House, and there he learned of Alti. He didn't catch it, he observed it. He learned of Alti, a mysterious Loch Ness monster of sorts, but a lot closer to home that supposedly living in the Altamaha River. It was found on April 1st, so people tried to argue it was a hoax. However, the news agency blurred out the middle of the thing because the seagulls had already started picking its guts out. This is washed up on the beach. There are things out there in the ocean, and it's a really big and really deep ocean that we are still just finding. Here's another one, February 27, 2019. Cue the X-Files music. Rare fish never seen in Northern Hemisphere washes up in Santa Barbara. This is a molatecta, it's a hoodwinker sunfish. It wasn't long ago the fish was even discovered to exist at all. We're still finding really big stuff that suddenly washes up on the beach, and as our technology gets better, sometimes we find it. This February 11th, a year ago, washed up on the beach near Scotland. No further information about it, but it's big, it's got a lot of bones in it, and then uh, just poof, there's big stuff in there. This. February 25th, 2020, washed up on a Mexican beach. Bizarre dolphin-like sea creature with no eyes. Why does it have no eyes? Because it lives where there's no light. That's deep. Sharp teeth watches up on a Mexican beach. None of the local fishermen interviewed by local media could recognize having ever seen something or anything similar, but they mentioned that Puerto Vallarta, there was a marine area with more than 1,000 meters deep. They had a deep. Obviously, this thing, again, doesn't have eyes, washing up. Along these lines, in June 12, 2007, a whale was caught and harvested, kind of sad, but it just, just giving you the news. And as they were cutting it up with a chainsaw, they hit the small object in the bottom of the photo. That object is the point of a spear that has a, an explosive in it that was patented in 1880, 1885. So somewhere after 1885, that thing was launched into the neck of a whale, either it exploded and wasn't in the right place to do enough harm or it didn't go off at all. And so for about 120 years, that whale is swimming around with this thorn in its neck of this projectile designed to bring it down. It brings up an interesting question, and that is, why is it the whales and the sea turtles and other aquatic creatures seem to have these really long lifespans? What is it living in the water gives them as an advantage over things on the earth? Again, less radiation, slowing things down. But we're dealing with Big Bang, and Big Bang, again, is a theory where all the matter in the universe condensed down the size of a decimal point or a period and then blew up into a Big Bang. But when we asked them the matter came from, then they said, well, then nothing blew up, and nothing created sun, moon, and stars, even though they're not evenly distributed and not spinning all in the same orientation. Earth and moon, they say, cooled down 4.6 billion years ago, but what's the problem with that? Where would the moon be? in the lap of the Earth, because it only can get 1.2 to 1.4 billion years close to the Earth, and after that, it impacts, and the gravity would be so damaging that it doesn't work. So we know it can't be any older than 1.2 based on what we observe. Dry land had formed, seas came out, and it began to rain on the oceans, rain on the rocks, until eventually the first simple cells were created. They suddenly appeared, and we've learned already there are no such thing as simple cells. They're complexing with the most so-called simplest form. 
statistically impossible for to get the, the, the proteins in the right order. Just, it doesn't happen, but let's keep going. Those simple cells mutated. This is the magic word. Mutated means a random chance mutation occurred that information got added that then made it something instead of simple cells to in invertebrate and invertebrate fish, et cetera, et cetera. And they kept mutating favorably and adding information that gave them new capabilities. Mutations generally observed by nature, by science, are a loss of information. You lose something, therefore it may make you just happen to survive. You, you have a mutation where your pigmentation changes, and so therefore for some reason everything else gets hunted, but you don't. It's a mutation, you lost information, but in this case with the threat around you, you actually survived. But mutations generally are a loss of information. The whole theory is banking on mutations adding information which I'll point out to you as we go through. So the idea is this, something very simple, which we know no longer is simple, would continue to add through mutation positive changes of improved capabilities that allow it eventually to become a low fin fish that's tired of living in the water, somehow is able to mutate so it can live in half of each environment and eventually get all the legs crawl out and now live in an air environment instead of a water environment. These are all supposedly positive mutations that have occurred over millions of years to get you with your TV remote. That's where it takes you. The secrets of evolution are time and death. Time for slow accumulations of favorable, which we don't usually observe, mutations, and death to make room for a new species, Carl Sagan. The Bible tells us you will find things reproducing after their own kind. So again, when you have a dolphin, it gives birth to a dolphin. So this brings up the geologic column. You'll find it in all kinds of textbooks all around the world. And the geologic column has come from post-Darwin, 1859. Darwin's origin of species then came out, Huxley and others, they began to put out this information and they proposed a geologic column. And that is, simpler things lived longer ago and again, through those ideas of favorable mutations, they continued to mutate until eventually you get you with a baseball bat. The only place in the world, in the world, you will find this column in correct order is in the textbook. Because they proposed it before they started really digging. Now that they dig, they find fossils jumbled all over in these mass fossil graveyards, which by the way, speak of a flood. But we'll get to that as we get into the flood. They take an object like this lobe fin fish and they say, well, it lived 65 million years ago. So since it's in this so-called layer here, therefore we know that layer is 65 million years old because it has that fish in it. So they date the layer by what's in it. If you say, well, hey, what's this? Well, how old is it? Oh, well, it's 65 million years old. Well, how do you know? Because of the fossil that's in it. So they use the fossil to date the layer and use the layer to date the fossil. How many have taken a logic class in college? That kind of argument is called a to totology, circular reasoning. The fossil dates the layer and the layer dates the fossil. So what happens when you find one of those fossils still alive? Well, look at that. How do you get fossils? Well, this is coming from a little National Geographic one of the ladies in the church sent me. She was reading it to her daughter. So I'm like, sure. An animal dies or an animal gets trapped by water sediment, you have to escape, get rid of the oxygen, you keep it from decaying, and you get it trapped in whatever fashion, it stays there, it hardens, and poof, you get a fossil. That's the idea. And a great way to get millions of fossils all around the world would be a global flood. This coming from biology, <coughs> principles and explorations from Hort, Reinhold, and Winson, 2001 textbook. They say, quote, fossils offer the most direct evidence that evolution mm -hmm. takes place. Wonderful. Fossils, therefore, provide an actual record of Earth's past life forms. Change over time, evolution, can be seen in the fossil record. Really? Okay. Evolution here, the evidence for both evolution and creation are determined really by two lines of evidence. One, what you find in the dirt, fossils. Two, what we observe of the ability to change. When you breed a chihuahua, you will get a dog. What happens every time you breed a chihuahua? You get a dog. What happens every time we bred cows? Cows, chimps, Chim everybody follow me. So we don't observe it, but they claim it exists. Now, there is variation. Great Danes and chihuahuas are both 
dogs. They're very much different, but they're still dogs. There's variation, but it's the same kind. So the idea with Darwinian evolution, again, is that a simple cell, which we learned isn't simple, through favorable mutations adds capabilities, which eventually spawn off into these different directions of life forms that will then get more and more complex as they go from there. But they all come back to, in Darwinian evolution, a single source. This is the theory they propose. The dotted lines are what we hope to find. The solid lines are what's actually in the dirt. What they find, even if they're old and we don't see them anymore on the earth, are f animals that recreate or reproduce after their kind. We find little horses and big horses. We find big dogs and little dogs. We find, but we always find the same kind of animal, and they're always reproducing after. They're always in these verticals. So we have these different kinds, but we're missing the way to join them. They're called transitional forms which are supposed to have happened millions and millions of times because you need a lot of mutations to change major capabilities, and we don't find them. So here we have the early so-called layers, Cambrian and Precambrian. Precambrian came first, and you have what is considered to be very simple things, but then there's a really big problem when you go to that next so-called layer, the Cambrian layer, because there is a massive explosion of new creatures, and there's no way to get to the old ones from them. It's like they just show up. That's what's in the earth. So David Berlinski, evolutionist in the book Tour of Calculus, he said this, there is no question that such gaps exist. A big gap appears at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion over 500 million years ago when great numbers of new species suddenly appeared, suddenly, in the fossil record. Again, Ariel Roth in his book Origin said the Cambrian explosion is not just a case of all the ma major animal phyla appearing about the same place in the geologic column. It is also a situation of no ancestors. Let me repeat, no ancestors. Do I make sure you caught that? To suggest how they might have evolved, we can't find those mutated forms. Biology here from Miller and Levine, 2002, they say the Cambrian period, which began 544 million years ago, is marked by an abundance of different fossils. Why the difference from earlier periods? By the Cambrian period, some animals had evolved shells, skeletons, and other hard body parts. That's a lot of mutations adding favorable information to create new functionality. There should be many failed attempts that didn't thrive. We don't have them. So back to the model here, and that is simple cell mutating favorably, producing all these different lines of different animals. But when we go through and we look at the fossil record, all we can find are the animals in their kind. So the evidence doesn't support the theory of Darwinian evolution. It's not there, and they have tried. Oh, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, I've seen pictures in a book. No, you've seen artist representations of some things they claim they find that virtually every single time fail under real scrutiny. If they had it, we would all know about it. Well, what about, we'll get to some of them. Fossil record, again, says, they offer the most direct evidence that evolution takes place, but what we find buried in the dirt are animals after their kind with no bridge to show us evolution took place. It's just not there. So the actual record says they reproduce after their kind. And it's not just from Precambrian to Cambrian. It's throughout. We don't find these transitional forms, which ought to be tons of them. So what do we find? First area, Precambrian, Cambrian, we just find them after their kind. Next issue, invertebrate to vertebrate. This is from Biology, Miller and Levine, 2000. Fishes, they say, are considered to be the most primitive living vertebrates. Similarities in structures and embryological development show that fishes and modern invertebrate chordates probably did evolve, probably did evolve, from a common, an, common invertebrate ancestors that lived many millions of years ago. So they tell us something changed from one to the other, yet they give them zero, zero evidence. The idea is this. There we are, jellyfish again and trilobites. These things apparently evolve into vertebrates. The problem is all we find in the fossils are vertebrates and invertebrates, but nothing in between. So we have this hopeful leap, but no evidence to show it. We just have them reproducing after their own kind. Ariel Roth, in his book Origins, he's a PhD in zoology, he said, however, we have virtually no evidence, let's try that again, virtually no 
evidence in the fossil record or elsewhere for any of the changes proposed during this immensity of time, but the public hears nothing of this problem. They don't tell you. They don't have them. So Cambrian, Precambrian, after their own kind. Vertebrate, invertebrate, all we find is one or the other after their own kind. So fish to amphibian, this one's a sacred cow for them. This coming from Biology Visualizing Life from Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston, <clears throat> 1998. And they say, because of these similarities, scientists think that the first amphibians were descendants of the lobe fin fishes, a group whose modern members include the coelacanth <clears throat> and the lung fishes. So the idea is they see the fin and it has bones in it. And you have bones in you. So they figured, well, those bones must have evolved into legs. Back to the idea of this fish with lobe fins eventually decides to get legs and then somehow figures out how to go from living in water to living in the air and eventually gets all four legs and is able to thrive. That's the theory. And the coelacanth was supposed to be a big part of that. They claim it lived about 70 million years ago, 2065 million years ago, and it was all going well until in 1938 someone caught one, a living coelacanth. Still 100% fish. Front fins were still fins. They made a stamp. They always seem to make a stamp when they find something cool. Here's our problem. This thing's an index fossil, so if it's supposedly 65 million years old and it's still swimming around, what does that mean about that layer? I'll show you some other things that were supposed to be gone further down the road. Here in 2007, we have another problem. Nice guy in Indonesia out looking for some food, hauls in a seal of camp. Four feet long, personal opinion, not a very attractive fish, and voila, it still has a fin. 65 million years later, all that chance to evolve, and it's still after its own kind. Just as God said. So what do we have? Well, so far, everything we find is after its own kind. So let's go to horse and whale evolution. Horse we'll get to next week because we only have so much time. We'll deal with Archaeopteryx, so-called bird transitional forms here, whales. Archaeopteryx <clears throat> is coming from biology, concepts, and connections. In 2000, they said, like modern birds, it had flight feathers, but otherwise it was more like some bi small bipedal dinosaurs of its era. For instance, like those dinosaurs, Archaeopteryx had teeth, wing claws, and a tail with many vertebrae. Okay, of course, here's the fossil, and there are several of them. However, a book called Tornado in a Junkyard, talking about Big Bang, James Perloff, doing some research on it, said, as for its reptile characteristics, yes, it had claws on its wings, but so does the ostrich. You know, the bird that's alive? And nobody considers it part reptile. And yet think the ostrich would have better case, snake-like neck, kind of like snake -like. I mean, think about it. It's just a bird. True, Archaeopteryx had teeth, but so did other fossil birds, and its teeth differed distinctly from those of reptiles. So it's a bird. It's a different kind of bird, but it's a bird. Thirdly, as to Archaeopteryx tailbones, further inspection, the vertebrae, further inspection has shown that it strongly resembles a swan, and then something you almost never hear, and they have found birds younger in their theory buried underneath it, which means they were buried before it. You don't hear that almost at all. So here's this thing that's supposed to be the link between them, and yet the things that come after it are buried under it. Here's another one, Archaeoraptor. It's true that dinosaurs are related to birds, <clears throat> but one purported missing link turned out to be <laughs> foul play. So clever. National Geographic, I mean, come on. Oh, that long name you can say at home is a bird-like creature with a tail of a carnivorous dinosaur that was featured in National Geographic magazine and displayed at the National Geographic Society in Washington, D.C. in 1999. But like Piltdown Man, time out, uh, Piltdown Man was a supposed missing link where a person took a human head and chimp teeth and ape jaw and filed them and made them all fit together uh, and didn't let people know that and presented it as a missing link. And for 50 years, it was considered a valid missing link. Some say there were close to 500 dissertations written about it until someone finally decided to go back and examine the originals. When looking at the originals, realized it was a hoax, and Piltdown Man was completely discredited. So when you get called Piltdown in this community, not a good thing. But like Piltdown Man, that proved to be too good to be true. We'll talk about him next week. What's now dubbed the Piltdown Chicken. <laughs> Ouch. 
was a composite of fossils from two different creatures. They put it out in 99, they waited to retract it till 2000. They let it sit out there as a supposed missing link. So what do we find? Yes, we find some strange birds, and they are different than what we have, but we only find them after their kind. So whale evolution. This is another one from Biology, Visualizing Life from Holt, Reinhardt, and Winson. You probably touched at least one of their textbooks through school. They say, quote, for, modern, for instance, modern whales are the descendants of four-legged land animals, okay, that are also the ancestors of horses and cows. As you can see in figure 10-4, fossil intermediates, which they propose, between modern whales and their 60 million year old ancestor reveal a history of slow transformation. Okay, let's review. Here's where the sperm whales dive. That's 3,000 meters. When they come up, they're covered in sucker marks and cuts, because now we know what they're fighting. We've seen it on film. Here's where the blue whales are, about 500 meters or so. Here's where the Alvin sub is, about 4,000 meters. Here's where our nuke subs are. That's a major change in pressure. You get down this far, again, things collapse and crush under the pressure. Yet it came from a land animal. Here are some things they need to develop. They have to have a huge lung capacity because sperm whales are down a mile and change looking for food. They have to have a powerful tail to get there, large flukes. Eyes that can stand not only to see underwater, but don't pop back into their head because of the pressure. Remember that champagne cork? Ears that can hear from out here in the air, able to change and evolve to be able to hear underwater without, again, being blown apart through the pressure. They also have to get rid of hair, lacking hair sweat glands, incorporate fatty blubber. They have to have whale fins and tongues that have countercurrent heat exchangers so they don't lose all their heat in the cold ocean. Their nostrils have to move to the top of their head. They have to be able to breastfeed underwater. I don't recommend it. And they have to develop sonar capacity so they can find things to eat. So, do we find anything trying to acquire some of these traits that didn't quite make it, that died, and we have it as evidence? Nicholas Kamenelis here, Creative Defense, he said this, insufficient time exists for such whale evolution to have occurred. Genetics calculations demonstrate that animals with a 20 year, 20 years between each generation could transmit to their offspring no more than about 1,700 mutations during a 10 million year period. That's the math based on what they observe. We're told that the ancestor of the whale was 60 million years before it. That would give you, based on their numbers, assuming they're correct, about the chance to have 10,200 mutations total. Fine. The problem is almost all mutations are harmful. Even if these 1,700 mutations were helpful, the new genetic code needed for a land animal to become a whale would be millions upon millions of beneficial mutations to bring forth the functionality so they can survive a mile or so down underwater. In other words, there's not enough time to have that many mutations, and the mutations are seldom, if ever, favorable, and we don't have any of these things that have tried to make that change that failed. We have no transitional forms. They've put out some things they suspect. They've had arguments like this. Well, whales, they had legs. What do you mean they had legs? Well, see the little bones? How many see them? It's awfully small. Are these legs? I said the same thing here in National Geographic. They said, you know, dolphins had hind legs, came from a four-footed animal. Really? Well, they did research. <clears throat> Those little bones have a known function. They differ in males and females. They are not attached to their vertebral column. And without them, you don't get whale babies. They are not vestigal. They are a purpose, purposeful structure for reproduction. They're not former legs. 1956, they found a, a, a sperm whale that was found with a five inch tibia projecting into a five and a half inch bump. So it's got a bump with a little something growing inside it. And they said, it's a leg. Number one, the sperm whales are 62 feet long. A five inch bump on a 62 foot long animal is essentially a pimple. <laughs> and obviously some kind of defect or some kind of abnormality, or abnormality that occurred in this animal, but it's not something they find on all of them. It was a sperm whale, but so desperate to find a leg on it because they've got to have this idea it came from the land. So what does it take? Well, you gotta find a new way to get around, walking to swimming. You gotta be able to handle the extreme air pressure, or water pressure, I should say. You gotta be able to handle and detect catching new prey, change your diet too. You gotta be able to breathe efficiently, even in storm of seas. Basically, everything has to change, and these guys are way far down doing this in extreme pressure. Try it this way. Here's a sperm whale. 
out for lunch. I know what you're thinking. Moves just like a cow. I got it. But I'm just trying to point things out. Here's what he's doing. I know, I know, you suspect cows do this too, but... This is sonar. Extremely good sonar. Without any military budget. You know what it takes to evolve sonar? How well do you eat when you don't have sonar? Now it's just a little snack. He's just getting started. If you've seen Finding Nemo, you know what this is. Starting to hit into the range that the pressure would crush almost anything else down there from us. How many have ever gone scuba diving, snorkeling? If you are in the water around porpoise, you'll hear this and around sperm whales. I've heard this, but from porpoises. And based on our last video, you know what this is. So think of a cow. No, seriously, think of a cow. You got 60 million years to go from a cow-like animal. You got a maximum 10,700 mutations possible, assuming they're all positive. And yet you need millions of them to make that kind of creature. And just one more thing here for you on whales. I know you see the cows doing that in the but mud more pits out in Honeybrook, the I know. The size is their intelligence and the sophisticated way they work together. The hunt begins as the whales dive beneath a school of herring, emitting high-pitched calls. In a panic, the fish flee to the surface where the whales concentrate them by releasing columns of air bubbles. The bubbles act as a barrier. The fish will not swim through it. The whales coordinate their efforts, so the bubbles surround the herring. Finally, the pod leader emits a sound that cues all the whales to ascend with mouths open. can eat a ton of herring a day this way. And they point out each time they come up, they're in the same spot. How do you evolve that from a land animal? How do you get it wrong and survive? And if you did have something trying to get it and get it wrong, why do we have any of them? There's none of them in the record. Just to show you how often things are being shown or found, here on February 3rd, just a few weeks ago, off of New Zealand, once again, they found, for the first time filmed off New Zealand, three ginkgo-tooth-beaked whales. As far as we know, there are no other confirmed live sightings at sea of this species in New Zealand, only a handful of stranding records where they get lost, they're beached. Due to their shyness of boats, offshore range, and deep diving habits, spending long periods of time underwater, they hardly ever see these. We're still finding things. 
So what we find out there in nature and in the fossil record are things that reproduce after their own kind. No matter which one it is, we find them after their own kind. Just as God told us we would find them after their own kind. What's in the fossil record? Animals that reproduce after their own kind. And that's supposed to be the most direct evidence for or against evolution. And what we find is what the Bible says, what we don't find is all the forms that had to change to get to what evolution says should be happening. So again, after their own kind. Now, I put, we'll have this article out there on the website. This is a great article, basically giving evolution a run for its money. And uh, they're going through and they propose some transitional forms in the lack of them. And I just had to share these with you. The first one was on the top left, Ceranosaurus, kind of a little seahorse combo there. Toucanamander, always good. Butterfant, talk about being able to attract a mate with those ears. I mean, if you, you know, the armadillant, these are all spurious, I hope you understand. Turtle gator, Roostersaurus, I mean, how about something? At least they made an effort because we can't find them out in the dirt. They aren't there. All we find are things fully formed, extremely complex, that if you reduce them, they will not function. In other words, what we find are things that clearly were simply, fearfully, and wonderfully made. Down at Cambridge, not Cambridge, at um, Claremont McKenna University, John, Ar John Lennox was there doing a speech, 2019. Very good, you can Google it, you can find it. And he quoted Dr. Stephen Hawking. Hawking said, quote, Religion is a fairy story for those afraid of the dark. Lennox was at a debate somewhere being asked by a reporter, can you respond to that quote? So he quickly responded and said, well then, atheism is a fairy story for those afraid of the light. It's good, good, good talk to watch. You'll, this will all be on the website while we we'll post it soon enough. We're out of time. We have a young earth based on lots of things that we look at. We find things only reproducing after their own kind. Shout out, again, fantastic movies coming out. This from Institute for Creation Research. They have a series, Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. Really good. I'm watching it, I've been enjoying it. It's out there. Uh, again, thanks to Mike Riddle for his fossil record information, Dr. Dino and others. If you wanna take the time, you have no, you will get so much information and it all leans on our side. But we're out of time, let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Go with your people, Lord, today, and I pray for anyone, uh, I don't know, maybe they're grinding their teeth. They don't want to hear this because it's easier for them to live with the idea there is no God, there is no final authority, there is no day of judgment, there is no life to come. Because if there is, they have to change. I pray, Father God, you would, through your Holy Spirit, call all who are listening, who don't know you. You are hearing this for a reason. Your Creator is trying to tell you you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are unique. He desires a relationship with you, but he will not force you. But he'll leave evidence all over the planet to convince you that he is God, there is no other. Lord, please touch those hearts. Help them to take the time, dig into these websites, be as critical as they want, but help them to realize the evidence brings us right back to the feet of Jesus. Thank you for these things, Lord. Thank you for revealing these things with technology and time. You are going to leave the generation that sees your return absolutely, positively, without excuse. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.